take a moment to remember that we're here to worship God. We're here to commune with each other and worship God together. Let anything that's bothering you go. And try to sing louder than me. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed me white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone. Can change the leopard spots, melt this, this heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed me white as snow. And before the throne, I stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. We're going to do the chorus again. Sorry. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. We haven't sang this one in quite a while. If you please pay attention to the lyrics. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be Restored, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love they will know we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. And we'll guard each one's dignity and save each other's pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Father from whom all things come, and all praise to who Christ Jesus is the Son, and all praise to the Spirit who makes us one, 
And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. They'll know we are Christians by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. Father God, again, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for who you've made us to you. We thank you for the opportunity we have to be Christ to those around us. I pray that you would help us to take that seriously and also teach us how to do that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. morning so uh, we actually have a lot of things to get through during our time together this morning it's uh, the day when we can affirm or raise issue with the gift discernments slate um, this is also the day for elder nominations I know that there's at least one in already uh, there's little slips of paper in the back and at some point I'll probably have someone pass those out so that we can get some elder nominations at the moment we only have two elders and uh, just for the record, Rob is not eligible to be elder for a year because I know that some of you probably thought that right out. Well, Rob should be the elder, perhaps in a year when he's eligible. Part of the succession model is making sure that the congregation doesn't start mommy daddying the pastor when then they come to talk to me and then they go to Rob and they're like, well, Luke said this. <laughs> Rob said we could have ice cream. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. Poorly. <laughs> All right. So, um, part of going through the story of man and God together is that there is a lot of information. Uh, last time I preached, we got to go through a rather large chunk. We talked about Noah. And actually, I was trying to keep in line with the story as, a, as an outline. And I even have it that way in the, in the bulletin. And then the more I went over the sermon, the more I added scripture that I thought needed to be read. And the more I'd add another section of scripture that I thought needed to be read. And then, well, that happened multiple times. And then I realized there was absolutely no way that next week I'm actually talking about Joseph. So the fact that it says that in the bulletin is my fault. We probably aren't talking about Joseph next week. We're probably still talking about Abraham because Abraham's life was very full and we have a lot of details. And as we talked about in Sunday school, uh, Abraham is the father of many nations and through him all the world is blessed and it would be a shame just to pass, pass, you know, just pass right on by him. Figure if Nicodemus got his own sermon, Abraham should probably get a couple. So I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 12. I'm actually going to put on these reading glasses too. I've just discovered these. I realize it's not a new technology. But my wife passed me some reading glasses one day. I'm always complaining about how I'm dyslexic and print is always so small. She hands me these things. Because theoretically I have 20-20 vision, but my, world's, my words swirl around because I have a, a learning disability. These are amazing. As I look around, most of you are wearing glasses, so this isn't new information for you. But between reading glasses and that steroid nasal spray that I should have been using for 30 years, my life has changed. I can breathe through my nose and I can read the words on the bottle. It's amazing. Anyway, chapter 12, the call of Abraham. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all of the peoples of earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told them, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. 
he took with him Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had, had accumulated, <laughs> and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. And they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the side of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So build an altar here to the Lord who had appeared to him. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he went toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abraham set out and continued toward Negev. So something worth mentioning at this point is that Abram comes from idol worshipers, I think moon worshipers even. And all of a sudden God presents himself and says, I want you to leave everything you know and go to a place I'm going to show you. He's not a young man. Some of you are probably pretty close to 75, and you can relate to the fact that now is not the time to start something new, unless that something new is, I don't know, a new cable package, possibly a different phone provider, but you're probably not looking to relocate. And God tells him to leave his family, though he does bring his nephew Lot which we talked about him a bit in Sunday school, and I'm sure I will again here momentarily. That's chapter 12. That's the call of Abraham. In chapter 13, Abraham and Lot separate over a dispute between the herdsmen because they both acquired great wealth because God has blessed them. So Lot takes the land near Sodom and Gomorrah, which is lush and beautiful, and Abraham, who let him have first pick, goes to the land of Cana, which is... Canaan, sorry, which is uh, pretty much the sons of Ham back in the story of Noah. And he gets involved in a dispute amongst kings. There's a war where there's four kings against five kings. And Lot apparently is with the people who are taken off, who are captured and taken away. So Abraham with 318 of his servants go and they defeat this army that is taken and pillaged from Sodom and Gomorrah's people and goes and rescues his nephew. And he brings everything back. And after he saves the day, of course, all the other kings come out to talk to him because that's important. And um, among them is the king of Salem, which is Melchizedek. And this is a really pivotal moment in the story because Melchizedek is referenced repeatedly in the New Testament as being a priest, priest of the God Most High. And this is what I think is a pivotal moment in the story of Abraham and how we practice Christianity. And I'm going to go ahead and read that. That's from chapter 14. I'll go ahead and start at verse 17. After Abram returned from de- defeating Kedor, mm-hmm. Kedor Lomer, that's his name now, and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheb, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of the God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or a thong of sandal, so that you are never able to say, I made Adam rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Aner, Eshkel, and Mm -hmm. Mamre, let them have their share. 
I'm taken by this, that Abram wants to make sure that there's a clear and distinct line between him and the king of Sodom. Because it mentions when, when Lot goes to the land of Sodom and Gomorrah that the men there are wicked before the Lord. And there's a lot of things going on in just this section of scripture. First of all, Abram tithes in a manner that we see later in scripture. He gives one-tenth to the Lord Most High. We also see that because of the Lord Most High, he does not want anyone to perceive that the king of this wicked nation has made him rich. All of his blessings come from God. In chapter 15, I'm actually going to read all of chapter 15 because it's honestly one of my absolute favorite chapters in the Bible. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? The one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Heir. I made it sound like error. Will be my heir. God has already promised Abram that he's going to give all this land to his descendants. And now Abram has this really interesting moment that we would be afraid to do where God is speaking to him in a vision and he tells God, well, where are my kids? What good is this promise? I don't have any children. And then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the heaven and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Right now, the scientific estimate on the number of stars, I'm going to science teach you for just a second, is four cotillion. If you're not used to that unit of measurement, that's with 24 zeros. That's an estimate of the number of stars. If you were to count that number one second at a time, well, your lifespan would have been over by a thousand years by the time you got to that number at least. Just one second at a time. I'm probably in mathematical error when I say just a thousand years. It'd be a long time. It would take you many lifetimes to count to cotillion and then do it four times. That's the number of stars. But again, that's an estimate. We don't know. What is the offspring of Abraham? A lot. What's the exact number? Well, we don't know. Anyway. Abram believed the Lord, and it credited to him as righteousness. That comes up later in the Bible also. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to and to take possession of it. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him and cut them in two and arranged the halves on opposite of each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. The birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. What you have here is a blood covenant, and I learned this from someone smarter than me. If you study Bedouin cultures, they still do this kind of stuff sometimes. This is what you would do, say, if two fathers made a marriage covenant when they're like, you know what, my son and your daughter should get married. They'll take an animal and they'll cut it in half, and then they'll take turns passing through the blood. And what they're in essence saying to each other is if I don't live up to my end of this bargain, you have permission. The expectation is you will dance in my blood, much like we're doing right here. And they'll both pass through this. And it's an understanding that this is serious. 
if you don't hold up your end of the bargain, the other person has every right to take your life. So what Abram is actually doing is he's setting up a blood covenant with God, which makes one of these verses later make a lot more sense. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep. This is the verse I'm talking about. And a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Have any of you experienced a fear that could best be described as a thick and dreadful darkness? Promises are hard to keep. Blood oaths with God are a different subject. The Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in their own country, or in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. That's a lot of foreshadowing that God tells Abram. What I'm most impressed by is from the opening of this chapter, Abram does not find it in his heart to try to haggle over this. He's like, you will be the father of a great nation. They will be blessed, but they're going to be enslaved for 400 years. These are the terms of this covenant. That's not just something God is telling Abraham. Abram, he's not Abraham yet. These are the terms of the covenant that Abram is entering with God. You will have these great descendants, but they're going to be slaves for 400 years but I'll bless them and punish those that enslave them. When the sun had set and darkness falling, a smoking fire pot with blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. So this is God passing through the blood first. In essence, culturally saying, if I don't keep up my end of this bargain, I will pay for it with my own blood. This is interesting imagery, and it feels weird to talk about. What happens next explains so much later in our narrative. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land from the river Egypt to the mighty river of the Euphrates, and the land of the Canaanites, Canaanites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. Notice that Abram does not go through the center of these pieces. God passes through it, even though Abram is the lesser party. What God is telling him is, I'm promising all this stuff to you. And if you can't keep up your end of the bargain, I will pay for it with my blood. If you didn't follow me there, that's okay. But I think this is beautiful. So part of this promise, of course, is that Abram's going to have all these descendants. Sarai, his wife, is fairly eld. She's quite old. She is uh, kind of made peace with the fact that she is not going to have children. She is barren. So she has a bright idea that Abram should have children with Hagar, her maidservant. And Abram, in true male fashion, goes, okay. If you say so. But then when she finds out, Hagar finds out she's pregnant, she actually despises Sarai for putting her in this position. She probably does not want to have a child with a hundred year old man. But here she is. 
Again, I'm in chapter 16 already, so I've already gone from chapter 12 to 16. I would highly encourage that you read this for yourself. These are broad strokes. I was intending to go 23 chapters today. We're not doing that. That's too much. This is actually already pushing it. Actually, when Hagar gives birth to Ishmael, Abraham is 86 years old. 86 years old. I was 28 years old when my daughter was born. I think I was 24, or my dad was 24 when I was born. My dad is currently 64? Yeah. Which is young to have a son this old being your third, I know. I can't imagine, though, my grandfather passed at 81, not in great health. The other one passed at 87. So my grandpa Johnson would have been around the age that Abram was when Ishmael was born. What happens, though, is really interesting because, well, obviously this is the son of promise. I have a son. It's very interesting. But then to have God tell you, no, this isn't the son of promise. Because he's already 86. But that's basically what happens in uh, chapter 16. There's far more to the story to involve that involves Sarai getting angry with Hagar and sending her off. And an angel speaking to Hagar, promising her that her son, too, will have a great nation. Which is true. We talked about that quite a bit in Sunday school. Actually, what the angel tells her is you are now with child and you will have a son and you shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard of your misery and he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. Historically, this has been true of the lineage of Ishmael which is most of the Arabic world right now is their lineage of Ishmael. Chapter 17, and this is where I'm actually going to finish up for today. Even though I intended to get all the way to 35, we're going to stop at 17 because this is a great place to stop. This, is, this deserves some emphasis. When Abram was 99 years old, which makes Ishmael 13. <laughs> By all Jewish standards, he is a man. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God Almighty. Walk before me blameless, and I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, which means exalted father, by the way. You will be, your name will be Abraham, which means father of a multitude. For I have made you the father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make the nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you, for generations to come will be to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now as an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you is to be circumcised. You are to, go under, to undergo circumcision as a sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring, whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. Every, my covenant 
in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. An uncircum any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God said to Abram, as for Sarai, your wife, Sarai means princess, her name will be Sarah, mother of many, or mother of nations. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Abram fell face down and laughed. He said to himself, Will a son be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of ninety? And Abram said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Something very important just happened here. Having a child at 86 is impressive. Doubting God will give you another child at 99 seems pretty run-of-the-mill. Logic and science tell us that his wife is not going to have a baby. But God says, yes, yes, she is. But he laughs. And it explains uh, this a little bit later, but their son, Isaac. Hi, Isaac. Isaac means laughter. Their son is actually named after the reaction of both the father and the mother when God tells them they're going to have a child. I'm sure Isaac is named that just because he's a good time. God said, yes, but your wife Sarah, oh, and he says, why not just give all this blessing to Ishmael? I already have a son. And that's when God says, yes, but your wife, Sarah, will bear you a son. And you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac whom Sarah will bear you by this time next year. And when he had finished speaking with Abraham, to Abraham, God went up from him. On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household were bought with his money, every male in his household, and circumcised them as God told him. Abram was 99 years old when he was circumcised, and his son Ishmael was 13. Abraham and his son Ishmael were both circumcised on the same day, and every male in Abram's household, including those born in his household or bought from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. Now, the reason why I'm stopping there is this is Old Covenant. Right? We no longer circumcise our males on the eighth day as a sign of an Abrahamic covenant. In Colossians, though, Colossians 2, 11 and through 15, Paul explains to Christians that our covenant with God is symbolized by baptism and not circumcision. So I'm going to try to present this as a non pedo baptist because this is where all my Reformed Presbyterian pastor friends go to try to tell me that I should be indeed baptizing babies. I don't agree with that takeaway, obviously. But I do agree with the importance of baptism. In him also you were circumcised with circumcision. Oh, the, again, this is Colossians 2, 11 through 15. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were raised with him through faith in the powerful goodness God yes you can never trust a printer I printed off that section of scripture thinking it would make my life easier not noticing that it cut off my last sentence <laughs> I know I've been going through a lot of scripture today. There's a lot 
here. All right, I'm going to read that again. In him you were also circumcised and putting off the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled a written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. All having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. What Paul does in Colossians is he explains that baptism has taken the place of circumcision covenantally as a symbol of us being God's people. We don't emphasize circumcision, or no, we don't emphasize circumcision, that's absolutely true. We also don't emphasize baptism like I feel we should sometimes. There's no mention of baptism in scripture apart from for the forgiveness of sins. And I think that's incredibly weighty. If you have not yet been baptized for whatever reason, I would highly encourage you to pursue baptism. If there's enough interest in a couple weeks, I would like to start a baptism and membership class. If you do not desire to be a member of Valley View Mennonite Church for whatever reason, on the last day of that class, I would still invite you to come so we can talk about the importance of baptism. At this point, unless there's a lot of objection, I am still very eager to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as we've been commanded to do in the Great Commission, though even if you're not into membership. However, I would highly encourage you to be a member. God didn't command you to be a Mennonite. He did command you to be baptized. I would like you to be a Mennonite. I like it here. I want you to be a part of this community. But what's more important to me is that you're a part of the Christian family. So if you have not been baptized, but are leery about joining a church body, I would like to invite you to be baptized. If you're interested, please let me know. One of the most beautiful passages in scripture is with an Ethiopian eunuch who is totally unacceptable by Jewish standards for many reasons. But after Philip explains the gospel to him, he says, here is water, what is to prevent me from being baptized? And that's incredibly powerful. But again, I just want to extend that invitation to you. If you have not been baptized, it would be my distinct pleasure to be able to offer that to you. And I think that's where I'm going to stop for this week. Next week, we're going to be jumping right into the mess that is Abraham's life and how God keeps blessing him in spite of himself over and over again. Actually, from this point on, Abram's pretty straight-laced. Abraham, that is. Then he has sons. <laughs> and they have sons. And they have sons. So again, next week, where it says the sermon is going to be the story, chapter 3, Joseph, part 1, that is not true. It's going to be the story, chapter 2, Abraham, part 2, which I did not know was going to happen, but it's very clear to me that it should. So we also have a bit of business to take care of this morning uh, as far as affirming the gifts discernment slate and nomination of elders. There's a basket in the back. Is there anything in that, Phil? Just one? If you do not have a slate 
or a paper and would like to nominate an elder, would you put your hand up so we can get one of those to you? There's a section on top of the gifts discernment slate where you can put an X to affirm all of the names, an X or a check. If there's anyone on the slate that you would wish not to affirm, you can even write a reason on the back why you do not feel that they're appropriate for the job. If you'd like to affirm them one at a time, go ahead and circle the names. And now I have to try to figure out what I did with my gifts to sermon slate. <laughs> I'll be right back. I would ask for your grace simply because I've never done any of this before. On the top it says, you are invited to indicate your affirmation of the following nominations for offices and ministries within the congregation. You can do so by circling the individual positions, positions <coughs> or affirming the entire slate by checking this box. Your suggestions or comment for the Gifts Discernment Committee are always welcome. Feel free to write any suggestions, comments, or questions on the back of this form. We thank you for your prayerful support. These are people that have all agreed to serve in these specific ministries. For Assistant Superintendent Sunday, sorry, for Assistant Sunday School Superintendent, we have Ron Troyer. For Assistant Primary Superintendent, Emma Keeler. For Usher, we have Gabe Esch. Sparty Fair Concession Committee, we have Andrea and, or Scott and Andrea Chelton. For Trustee, we have Austin Wanker. For Meat Cannon Committee, Dan and Brianna Benson. For MCC Representative, Brianna Benson. Brianna, sorry. I have a cousin, Brianna. It always messes up how I say that. For Finance Committee, David Wanker. For Bible Memory, Janet Troyer. For Ohio Conference Delegate, Janet Esch. Visitation Committee, Jim and Kristen Homa. Venture Club is Mike and Judy Catalpew. Gospel Concert Committee, Connie Bell. Children and Youth Council, Marilyn Keeler. MYF Sponsor, Chad and Judy Keeler. And Gift Discernment, Gifts Discernment, Alice Stolzfus. If you would all stand, if you can do so without pain, I'd like us to pray about this. I know some of you have already handed it in, but still. Father God, again, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for how you've blessed us with this community. I pray that you would help us to fill the slate with the people that are suited for the ministries. I pray that you would help us to find a way to support each other and to lift each other up so we can better serve you and better serve each other. Father, I thank you for the names on the list. I thank you for the people that you're raising up among our congregation to serve. Thank you for all the young names on this list as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you'll stay standing, though, because I forgot about the elder nominations. Are those already in? Okay, well, let's pray about that as well. Father God, as we lead or as we head forward from here with so many changes and so many different things happening, I pray that you would raise up someone that you desire to help lead this congregation, Lord. I pray that you would help us to recognize the gifts in each other. 
Pray that you would help us to support and lift up whoever it is that is named. Pray that you would use them mightily. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Any more ballots? Oh, there's one. I'm still trying to figure out the nuances of doing things ceremonially. I'm kind of a train wreck in that department. I'm sure you're noticing. My classroom runs very much like that, though. At this time, I'm going to ask Mike Tuffy to come up to lead us for a time of announcements, sharing, and prayer. I'm going to pull my mask down because if I take it off, there goes my hearing aids. It pops them right out. So... What announcements do we have? There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board for Holly Whitmer's uh, baby shower. Two weeks, there'll be a carry-in dinner here for Rob. And an open house. Any other announcements or prayer requests? Thank you, Jude. With, uh, with all the transition and change that happened, I'm kind of losing my mind. Forgot that I'm not quite done yet because we have we'll have a uh, annual business meeting coming up in October if we hold to the pattern we've used in the pa past the first Sunday of October. And um, so my term as pastor didn't end until the end of the church year, September 1st. So anyone who was in a ministry position, if I didn't get a memo out for people to submit their annual reports, so if you were used to doing an annual report or if you were in a ministry position of some kind, uh, please get those in uh, and we'll... Um, so that we can get our report packet put together for the annual meeting. So um, that time is short, it's only three weeks away, but um, if you can get those uh, annual reports in, you can put them in my box and then I'm gonna give them to Kristen and she can <laughs> put it together. So at any rate, um, and I'll try, to, I'll try to get word out to people who may not be present if, if a report is, um, if a report is due from from them as well. And the second thing is I have a confession to make. Um, my wife was writing a letter to her good friend Suzanne and I walked by the table and it was all laid out there and I saw my name in the letter. So being a nosy Nellie, <clears throat> I read that and here I read that the church, the men of the church were going to put a roof on my house for me um, and, and Jan was expressing to Suzanne how wonderful it is to be a part of a church that, you know, support, is willing to support us in that way. That was news to me. I told Jan a couple of days later, um, I have a bone to pick with you. <laughs> uh, I said, did you, or did you, is this something you've done? Did you set that up? And she, oh, she was just devastated. No, no, no. Anyhow, the cat's out of the bag. And then I find out we were invited for supper to Don and Christie's, and I find out that the whole thing was a roost to get me out of the house so the guys could come and do measurements, which I had already done. Uh, you could have just asked. Anyhow, the, I've got the materials. I, I already have the, I, the shingles are there, the, the equipment is there, everything is there. What I, what I really will appreciate, and this is an incredible gift, is the manpower to do it. Uh, so anyhow, thank you very much for doing that. Sorry, I, my nosiness ruined the surprise, um, but, it, but it still is a surprise. It's really, 
it's really nice. And Jan did not want me getting up on the roof. I told her, you know, so much for that because if the guys come to work on the roof, I'll be up there with them, just like I was down there at Ron Troyer's neighbor's place, you know. So anyhow, um, but the materials are already there. Materials, equipment, everything is already there. Uh, whatever date that you decide, you know, is going to be fine with me, I just wanted to get it done sometime this fall. So that was my plan, but, uh, but thank you for, for that gift anyway. <clears throat> when those people show up, Rob, you better be surprised. <laughs> is there any? Um, for the uh, 27th, which is uh, the retirement party for Rob, um, that second part, the open house from 2 to 4, that's the open to the community section. For us, I'm hoping that we'll have a nice carry in dinner for the church right afterwards and then maybe some cake and ice cream and stuff for the community people. But I know many people in the community that have been touched by Rob in many ways. And I've been told by two or three separate people on different occasions when they're like, oh, Rob's your pastor. He changed my life. I'm like, that's interesting. You don't attend our church. Like That kind of revelation would... No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I would like to give those people that have maybe taken his Bible classes at the High Ed Center or World Religions or have been involved in beekeeping and song circles and hospice and social services and foster care over the past several years, the opportunity to come talk to him as well. So get the word out that we're doing that, by the way. I'm going to put something in the Cory Journal this week at some point. Besides being a nosy Nelly, it seems Rob has his hand in everything. <laughs> Any other announcements? Prayer requests? I was just saying also on, on Dark and Cool Talks and all that, we will have uh, the Ann Arbor Treasurer on Thursday. And some that may have to repair a boat dock, plus, uh, I don't know how. So things are going fairly well. I feel like Harvey's not communicating very well. Top half, the heart's not synchronizing with the bottom. It's closed. And her blood pressure was 80. And when Dars couldn't pick her up, she got a little bit upset and carried on. And it went up to 120 or so. But it indicates that the heart is working on its own. So that's good news. Uh, so I have a small litany of things to, that I would like prayer for. The first of all is I would very much like your prayers as I'm trying to figure out how to move through the Old Testament in a way that brings glory to Jesus and doesn't bore you to tears. So please be praying for my sermon prep time. That's a selfish prayer, I know. Um, I would also ask, I'm in, involved with a group of people that are trying to figure out how to extend my school into a middle school, which is actually really right now just a group of four guys. Almost every year someone presents it and it gets shot down for the sake of, well, we really can't afford it. It's quite a financial commitment. But the more I look at the world around us, the more I come to the conclusion that education is not neutral. It is no longer neutral. Your children are being indoctrinated. What are they being indoctrinated to? 
So that's just something else I would like prayer for as we try to move forward. I have about another three weeks to get a presentation together to pitch to my school board. So if you could please keep us in prayer about that. And also uh, that missional discipleship initiative that Rob and I and Scott and Jim and Dave King and Joe have all been involved in. If I miss somebody, I'm so sorry. And a lot of the ladies actually in the church have started to get, and Ron, sorry, Ron, Ron's in it too. Um, and Kyle. Um, we're about to another start period or another uh, milestone where the, the coaches are taking all these courses and things like that. And Compass Church and Climber is going to be using this as their church discipleship program as well. And they've got an untold number of people that are about to get started. And I think from within the last two years, our, our initial start point was nine people. We're somewhere between 60 and 100 right now. So if you would please keep that in your prayers as well, the, that's the MDG. And if you're not involved, I would highly recommend that you find a way to get involved. Not as highly as I recommended that you get baptized this morning, but distant second. I would highly recommend you get involved. So Brock and Kristen, who are our missionary couple, right when everything was closing down, they came back from Africa. And I've received notice that they would like us to discontinue support. So we are going to be looking for a new missionary opportunity. So be praying about what that looks like, please.
he said. I know in spite of ourselves, God still loves us, and he will never forsake us or leave us. I just have to remember it daily. Is there anyone else that has something to share? I knew if I stood here long enough, I'd get up. Uh, so there's always stuff to pray for, always. Uh, if you could remember the Schwartz family. Uh, Logan's funeral was this Thursday. I'm also very grateful that Rob decided to not fully retire and take the bulk of this funeral because I was ill-equipped. Yet I found myself less in the strangest place, and I'll go ahead and share it with you. You know how we all have those conversations of goofing around with our friends when we're like, I want you to come to my funeral dressed as a lifesaver or just something ridiculous like that. Logan had recently had a conversation much like that with one of his buddies. So I actually had the opportunity to see a pallbearer dressed as the Grim Reaper sobbing his eyes out. Because of what, about a month ago, Logan had asked him to come to his funeral dressed as the Grim Reaper. And he actually did it. And I realized none of my friends would have done that for me. As goofy and ill-placed as that is, he wasn't joking around, he was broken. I thought that was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in a very bizarre way. But if you could just pray for his friends and family, I can tell they're not all doing very well right now. If you can do so without pain, please stand up. Father God, Again, we come before you, very aware that we need you. Father, I bring faith before you. I thank you that her surgery went as well as it did. I pray that you would continue that little girl's healing. I pray that you would help Keith and Darcy know how to meet her needs, that you would give the doctors wisdom. Father, I would, I would pray that you help our church transition, both with a new pastor and whatever is going on societally. Pray that you would help us to grow closer to each other with the realization that we are kingdom people. And that you're greater than any disagreement we could have or opinion that we hold. Father God, I pray that you would help my group as we're trying to figure out how to extend to a Christian middle school, Lord. I pray that if you're not in it, that you would kill it quickly. But I pray that it would be about you for the glory of you. Father God, I pray for the Missional Discipleship Initiative. I thank you for the hundreds of people, the thousands of people getting involved around the world. I pray that we wouldn't focus on the program itself, but we would focus on you, and that the program only works because it forces us to look at you. Father, I pray for Christy as she goes to see the sugar specialist. I pray that you would give them wisdom to know what Christy needs so that she continue to con continue to be there for her family and pursue her new career. Father God, I pray for Holly who's having a baby shower soon, Lord. I pray that you would just reveal your love to her new every morning. Father God, I thank you for family, both church family and our family families, Lord. I thank you for all the people that you've blessed me with. Thank you for those that comfort me. I thank you for those that challenge me. Father God, I praise you for the 65 years that Willis and Nancy have been married. Father, I pray that you would comfort Nancy as she misses her loved ones. I pray that she would be able to use that as a reminder for prayer. Father, I pray that you would help us to find a new missionary opportunity. That your word would continue to go out and that we can have a role in that, Lord. Father, we praise you that you continue to provide despite ourselves. 
May you provide people to pray for us. That you save us from our depression. That you provide us with true relationships, both with you and with each other. Father God, we lift you up. I pray that we would be able to bless you as you've blessed us. Please be with these nominations and the gifts to sermons as they go forward, the gifts to sermons late. Pray that our church, your church, would grow 